Hey everyone, it's the Drive School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman and um, my, my good friend, uh, Pastor Chris Brademeyer is back. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day here in North Dakota. It's like almost 35 degrees out, which is very <laughs> strange for December. How are things down there? It doesn't even hurt when I breathe outside. Let's just call that a good day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's good here too. Uh, we're we're right in the middle of Advent as we record this, and I, it's one of my favorite church seasons. It might be my favorite church season. Just it, it it's it's not just pretty, but it's 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 confrontational. It, it it challenges a lot of sort of presuppositions that um are, are are worth thinking about, and it always ends on comfort. Um, and, and so kind of in that theme, um, y- you you think logically you, you you understand philosophy and so I, I can bring you sort of really challenging questions that that sort of have a gut answer but if you think about them they might not um they might not necessarily be that way and we were, we were tossing some stuff around before we started recording and you threw one out there that it just seems to defy every reason and norm uh but you said there are times when a church should not baptize somebody but we want everybody to be saved why would a church not baptize somebody well, you know, I, I'm going to put a caveat out here. I am not, yeah. you know, God, right? So this is not a thus saith the Lord. And this is a very difficult topic. And, and if you ask pastors about this, when it comes to kind of some of these hard cases that are not clear cut yeses or nos, um, you're going to find some disagreement amongst really solid, faithful pastors. So I just want to make sure everybody's clear about that, that this necessarily isn't the way your pastor might solve this. Um, and your pastor and I might have some disagreement about this, but you know, this is the problem with real life is things get messy. Principles are easy. Application is sometimes hard. Right. So maybe even before we dive too deep, we can say two things here. It's good to have sound reason and it's very, very good to have sacred scripture as our rule and norm. Um, But recognize like if, if your pastor disagrees, go talk to your pastor. That's what he's given by God for you. Go and talk to your pastor. And there might be some some individual details per some circumstance that you just might not know about because you're not your pastor. Um, right. So we, we sort of want to sort of recognize that this is not a uh, leverage against church practice in, in your own congregation or anything else. Uh, but, but we're going to think based on what we can understand with God's word as our rule and, and guide and because it, it does get messy. Well, and you know, that's, that's, I think, really a big one, too, that I just want to reiterate. Your pastor makes the decisions in his church. And, you know, Harrison and Pastor Goodman and I, we are not privy to all of the details or all the facts. And, and most of the time, parishioners aren't either. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the fourth commandment would tell us, hey, you just got to trust that your pastor's doing the best that he can. And if you have some question, the guy to talk to is him, not, you know, listen to some random dudes on the Internet, right? You go talk to your pastor first. So I think we got all our caveats out of the way, right? I like it. Yeah. All right. So um, obviously, when would you baptize somebody? Well, it, biblically speaking, I think we can have a pretty clear cut case that we baptize people who have come to faith, right? Um, you know, you think about the Ethiopian eunuch, right? He's, he's uh, you know, here's water. What is to prevent me to be baptized? Okay, you baptize the guy. Um, you know, the word of God creates faith wherever the word of God is. And we Lutherans don't like to pit one form of the word of God and the way that it works on us against another. So if a, a person who's older hears the word of God and comes to believe, then they will want to be baptized because baptized gives all of, uh, baptism gives all the promises that baptism gives. So, you know, they wouldn't want to not be baptized. Um, that's pretty obvious. The other one, too, is, you know, like in Acts chapter 2, we have the command to baptize whole households. You know, um, so we baptize children. Like Jesus says, you know, let the little children come unto me. So we baptize the children of Christians, churchgoers. That's pretty clear cut as well. Um, On the other hand, what would be clear not to do would be to not baptize unbelievers, people who profess faith's counter to faith in Christ. So, you know, um, and not that this would ever actually happen, but for the sake of discussion, we'll pretend that it would. An atheist shows up at the church and wants their kid baptized. Well, you know, they say, I don't believe in God. Well, I'm not going to baptize your kid because you're not a believer. You're not going to bring them to church. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's that's a problem, right? Or if the uh, an adult convert says, I'm actually a, a Muslim and I don't want to give up my faith. I'm just doing this because it'll make my future wife's family happy if they think I'm a Christian or something like that. Well, we wouldn't baptize somebody if we knew they were coming to the the water and the word under false pretenses, right? Um, right. So baptism is, is the beginning of a life in faith. It, it makes us children of God. It adopts us into the family. And so let's use that language um, that that scripture gives us. If, if I said I was going to have a child and then intentionally not feed him or her, like th- that's a bad thing. It, it, a baptism is, is not 
the end of faith, but it is simply the the beginning uh, of faith that goes into life everlasting. Yeah, that's the uh, other thing about baptism. When Jesus institutes it in Matthew 28, right? Everyone remembers the part that's in the catechism, you know, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But they forget that the sentence doesn't stop there, right? It also says, and teach them everything Mm -hmm. that I have commanded you. So that means that baptism brings with it an obligation for instruction and formation as a Christian. We call that catechesis. And so if it's clear that's not going to happen, a pastor should, is obligated to say no. Um, and cool. now that brings us to the things that are neither quite clearly in column A or in column B. And this is where I think sometimes things get a little bit more difficult. So what do you do with somebody who um, hasn't been to church for a long time, but they're a baptized member of the congregation? They bring their kid. Um, the kid maybe didn't even get born in quite the right circumstances. Say mom and dad aren't actually married. They're just living together. What do you do? Well, this is going to vary a whole lot. It's going to depend on the disposition of the parents, what their confession is, what they're looking for. Um, There's a lot of conversations that a good pastor has with somebody in this situation before a determination is made either yes or no. Um, And sometimes it takes a while to figure out exactly how we're going to do this and what we're going to have to have happen here. So like, for example, um, I had a, a situation one time where a lady had a child out of wedlock. It was a, a, a like a, a hookup kind of a thing. And um, she uh, approached the church and asked for a baptism, but she didn't live in the area anymore. And But she had moved back in with her parents after having the baby. And I said, look, um, I am all about baptizing babies. I love baptizing babies. I think it's great. We should baptize babies. You should um, come to church and, uh, and we'll talk about this, right? Unless there's an emergency. Emergencies kind of throw everything else out the window. If babies you know, in the hospital dying, then we we just cut right to the chase and we yeah. go baptize the kid. And so she came to church for a while. We got the kid baptized. Um, that one actually blew up in my face because as soon as the kid was baptized, she moved back to her previous lodging and started going to a church that uh, teaches believers baptisms and unfortunately taught the young gentleman to uh, despise his baptism, which is really unfortunate. So, I, I mean, but this is a, a case in time where you can't predict the future um, and, and only God knows. And, and you get to sort of commend this to the mercy of God like you do with even in the most ideal baptism. Um, you, you know, um, generational Christian grandparents go to church, parents go to church, older brothers and sisters go to church. You can't predict the future. You, you baptize with the idea that that what this is, is is a promise that God will nurture and forgive and, and, and sustain. And you just have to let God be God there because we're not God. Um, but, but you're right though. And just sort of even asking parents what they want for their children. And a lot of times clears it up. Do you want your child to come to church regularly and receive God's gifts? And they're like, you can't go into the secret heart. You can, you can sometimes go based on, well, your, your mouth has said one thing and every other part of you has done another for a long, long time. Maybe can we, can we just like make sure we're being honest with ourselves here, but it's not yours to predict the future. It, it, it's also not yours to know the secret hearts. So what, what can you sort of start to measure? Well, you can't measure what's going on inside the secret heart, like you said, and you can't see the future. All you can go with is what you are told and what you see. Mm-hmm. And so if someone comes to church and they say they want their kid baptized because they want the promises of baptism, then there's no reason that you should say no. Right. You know, the Eighth Commandment tells us we err on the side of taking people at their word. (laughs) You know, if somebody wants to be baptized, we err on the side of God's grace. Um, And that's kind of been my general rule of thumb. I've probably done baptisms that I know other brother pastors may not have. um, And I don't think that they would have been necessarily wrong to say no. But again, I kind of err if I'm if I'm if it's a coin toss, I always err on the side of of giving a baptism because God's grace is important and I trust mm-hmm. God to do what he promises. But also I know that there's warnings in scriptures like, you know, there's that passage in Luke um, where the demon is cast out to the poor person and then uh, runs around waterless places and comes back with seven others worse than himself and, and ends up the state of the person, person worse. Yeah, yeah. You, we don't want to do that to people. You know, we don't want to give somebody a baptism and cast out the demons and make room for the Holy Spirit only to have that presence of God wither in their life. And, you know, that's why pastors are concerned about this. And I think that's really the the main point that I would like people to take away is if a pastor says no for a baptism, for, for a wedding, for anything, it's not because they hate you. Mean. Yeah. It's not because they're trying to be mean. It's because they're worried and they're concerned and they don't want something worse to happen to you. Because there are warnings in Scripture about being glib with the gifts of God, and we don't we don't want to do that. 
Right. There's even just descriptions in scripture about what the gifts are and that that should sort of be a So the Ephesians uh, talks about uh, the armor of God and, and, and it very much, I, I think, alludes to baptism there um, in, in both word and in, in, in sacrament. Um, why do you think you need armor if there's nothing bad out there? Um, a, the devil's if, crawling if you, around like a lion, right? Roaring if you're going to act as if there's nothing bad out there, that might not be good. If I'm going to give you armor and you're going to set it down, um, listen, I, I, I want you to have the armor, but I, I need you to wear it because it's, it's dangerous out there. Take this. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's well, the other thing with the armor too, it needs to be maintained and without continually being brought back to the word. The armor is not going to get cleaned up and oiled. It's going to rust and it's going to become immobile. And then eventually it's going to get cast aside as being seen as useless. You know, and that's, I guess, it's kind of a concluding thought, I think maybe would be if somebody's baptized, right? All of the promises of baptism are available in baptism. That doesn't go away. You know, even if someone's baptized as a baby, we actually have a gentleman in our church who was baptized as an infant in the Catholic church. Um, He never went to church again. I think he said he went once or twice for weddings and that was about it. And he married a young lady at our church, went through instruction, and he's now a a very, very uh, um, vigorous member of our church. And uh, he was really surprised because he would come up with... uh, for communion with her and he was not yet a received member. So he would just come up and I give him a blessing. And when I bless people, I always put my hand on their head and say, the Lord bless you and keep you in your baptism. And so at first he didn't know if he was baptized. And so he had to go look into that. And then he found out he was. And after he proudly informed me he was baptized, I started talking to him like he was a Christian and not a pagan. And he asked me about that one day. He said, why are you talking about me with we pronouns? You know, you talk about being a Christian, you always say we. He's like, I haven't been to church in years. And I said, yeah, but you were baptized. And that does mean something. Mm -hmm. Even if you've neglected it your whole life until this point, you have still been baptized. And all of the things that we talked about in the catechism for baptism, that's all still yours, right? It's all there for you because Christ promised it would be. And that doesn't depend on you. And even though you've done nothing with it and it's done you no good, it's still yours. And that's not something we should ever uh, scoff at because here we have this young man who if I would have been his pastor and his mom showed up out of the blue one day and said, let's baptize this kid, I might not have done it because she never came to church. And so, yet, I mean, here, look what the Lord did here. <laughs> this is just it, though. You, you can talk about God's timing as sort of like a, a really sort of wonderful, mysterious, always works out for the, the best kind of end. But maybe even just to talk about this, it, it recognizes that if God's timing is such, then even our no's are just a not yet. Um, because we we don't know what the future holds either, and, and so in the same way that 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 baptism all looked for naught until it wasn't, um, the the no just might mean a, a not right now, but not right now is a common answer everywhere in the world. Um, I, I know that I, I'm desperate to uh, receive things within two days now, thanks to Amazon, but um, sometimes not yet is a healthy answer for a lot of different things. This, That's a great answer in the church. Point. It works great with baptism, sometimes with you know marriage issues, sometimes with a closed communion. You know, if someone comes to church and they're not a Lutheran, not a confessional Lutheran, and they want communion, and man, it works great to say, you know what, I'd love for you to commune with me, but you can't yet. So let's mm-hmm. talk about how to make that happen. And that's a lot different than just saying, no, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, because that, that's not what we want. That's not what the Lord wants. The, sometimes it, it just might not be time, but well, that just means the time will come later. Right. So I guess, you know, to circle back around on all this stuff, I I guess, uh, you know, the way I put this together again, is I look at the person's confession, I look at their, their activity. And, um, if I, if I'm kind of up in the air about it, I err on the side of grace, but you know, I I've had people come kind of just appear out of thin air and say, Hey, we'd love to have you baptize our kid. And I say, well, are you a member of a church? I don't know. Do you go to church anywhere? Uh, no. Okay, well, we need to talk about what it means to be a Christian before we talk about things like baptism, because yeah. something got lost in translation here. And if they ghost me, well, I guess that problem guess solved itself. That. I didn't even get to the point where I could say no. Well, but that that's not yours either, on account of not being God, which is good. His job's way harder than mine, uh, so maybe I should stop whining about it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad he does, has to make the hard decisions and not me. All I have to do is say what he said. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Pastor, thanks for helping me think through that one. Um, I know it's sort of a sticky topic, uh, and it, it gets stickier when we attach a lot of emotion to it, but we, we stick God's word first, and then we, we think, and we, we pray for, for God to be merciful. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Till next time.